All right. How we look? How we work? Does it sound all right? Yeah. You guys can hear me because I'm really loud sometimes, so I probably don't even need this thing. But um, I am BJ Rousey. Happy to be here. I'm happy to see a few faces here because you know, the last day after lunch and the prizes have been given out. It's like good time, good time slot that we got. So excited to be here. I have Summer with me as well as. I don't need any introduction here, everybody. I think everybody knows Mike Bustiker every time I walk around with him. Mike, Mike, Mike. It's like, is there anybody you don't know? So they're just, uh, you know, finding Nemo people. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike asked us to kind of speak with him, uh, take this opportunity to talk about HDM department data analytics and huddle boards. And I was like, okay, I'm happy to do that, but I'm your medical device security guy. But hey, I'll try and I'll try anything once. So Summer and I are, are part of our medical device cybersecurity team, but we're happy to present with Mike. Um, it's always a, always a great opportunity. All right, so let's get into this. Um, talk a little bit about Intermountain Healthcare. Um, when we talk about Intermountain Healthcare, we are based out of Salt Lake City, Utah, and, and we actually cover quite a few areas around the, the Wasatch Front there, as well as Utah, Idaho, Nevada, and ever expanding into Colorado shortly, as well as Montana. Yeah, coming to a state near you soon. How does that sound? So we're, we're kind of working on how to do that. So um, in looking at the, the slide there, we're defining our HTM mission, vision, values, and high level objectives. And, and really what we're gonna talk about today is understanding our organization. What What is our organization's vision and values? And Summer's gonna go into that in a few minutes here and talk about that. And then how do we as an HDM department jump on board with those vision and values of the organization and align ours as well with them? Um, meeting the standards and regulations at the baseline as well as what we have accomplished. So um, trying to make sure that uh, we're meeting the organization standards and what they need to have done as well as what have we already done? Um, just to let give you a quick background um, with Intermount Healthcare with our, our clinical engineering sports services under Mike Bustiker, we used to be all these separate siloed hospitals and we are working into one solution. Um, Mark Harrison, our, C our CEO has a one Intermount objective and we are on board with that to try to move forward to say, hey, we don't have all these silos. Yes, we have multiple directors that Mike will go through here later but we are one enterprise team and that's kind of the way that we're trying to push forward. So we're gonna talk about how we are doing that and, uh, and what we've been able to accomplish so far and hopefully it helps you in your areas as well. Um, what's next? Uh, finding gaps and opportunities to grow your HDM department. Um, I am a gap filler, as you can tell. Um, we, are somewhat new within the last three years as a as a cybersecurity team in the HTM side. We are actually pretty new, so uh, we've we've seen one of those gaps where we realized, hey, we got a great CTIS team. Our IS guys they cover things great. They do a great job. Um, we're excited with what they do, but they don't have the expertise on the medical device security side. And if you've ever had the chance, Mike Busker actually wrote a book about this, or. I'll get after a chapter in a book about this. Um, and it, it's really beneficial. Uh, take the opportunity to go out there to the Amy website and grab that book. Uh, talks about cybersecurity within an HDM department. And it's really one of the most important things. Um, I come from the IT side, 20 plus years doing IT. Where's my director walking over? Um, <laughs> the, uh, I guess that was bad. This is what happens in meetings. Mike always tells me I talk a lot. So um, anyway, so uh, see if I can get back on track. Um, finding those gaps to improve. So one of them obviously with us is cybersecurity and there are other gaps and we will go over those shortly. So uh, as far as step back reviews, one of the things that Intermountain does is step back reviews. The opportunity to, as leadership and upper leadership, step back and see where we are, right? Get an idea. Hey, what the stuff that we've been pushing forward, where is it? Where is it now? What's it doing for us? Um, and those step-back reviews are, are wonderful to have and wonderful to talk about. Um, gives you the opportunity to speak to leadership that maybe otherwise you wouldn't get the opportunity to speak to them. So step-back reviews can be very helpful. I think it's always good for 
uh, the boots on the ground out there to seek leadership and to understand and have that association with your leadership, right? They need to know who you are. They need to know that you know who they are. So that's one of the big things that we've pushed. Um, a little more about Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, as I talked about, we've got 25 hospitals, including our virtual hospital. A very big thing. I'm sure a lot of you have talked about this uh, with the pandemic. Um, virtual visits. Uh, we're putting a lot of effort into that right now, right? Um, that is one of our big things. And obviously, our hospitals are growing. You've probably seen a few acquisitions and mergers that we have coming. Um, I won't get into those at this point in time because we can really go down the rabbit hole there if we need it. Uh, we have 300 plus clinics serving a six state area. Uh, we have our Select Health, which is our insurance provider um, that provides insurance uh, on the other side. We have well over 41,700 caregivers. Um, we are the biggest employer in the state of Utah, which is great. Wonderful employer. I've, I've been working for Intermountain for 24 years this last, just this past month, and I've loved every minute of it. So. Um, we also have 2,400 uh, employed physicians and 38 affiliated physicians. So we're a pretty good sized company. We're not, we're not, you know, Mayo, but we're fast becoming Mayo. How's that? So we're trying. Um, so some things that we're doing. Uh, we are growing. Uh, we are building new hospitals. We've had, as you can see here, we've had a few hospitals that have opened recently. Um, in 2018, we opened Layton. We took our Dixie Regional Medical Center here, just up the street here, 90 miles or so in St. George. We've added on to that facility due to, due to the amount of people that are coming in. Um, we've added on to that and, and expanded to it. Our Spanish Fork Hospital opened this year. Um, we had an area in a more rural community just outside of Provo uh, where we had a need and we were able to fill that need by building a hospital for them. We have, uh, as you guys may be aware, we have Primary Children's in Salt Lake City, which is one of the world-renowned primary children's hospitals, one of the children's hospitals that does so much work. And because we are the youngest state in the nation, we, we do have a lot of kids there. And so we are building one uh, down in Lehigh right now. Uh, construction has started, I actually drove by it on my way here. And it is framed and everything and up. Um, and we will be, I believe it's set to open in 2024, I believe. So um, the Saltzer Idaho acquisition, we're excited. We got to meet with them. We're excited about the opportunity to, to help them and them help us as we as we work together to move forward there, as well as our Nevada healthcare partners down here in Nevada. Uh, wonderful opportunities down here to, to be able to grow. Um, talking a little bit, this, I know this is a little bit of an eye strain for those of you in the back. Wait a minute, you guys are on our team. I don't care about that. They, they, they know. Yeah. They know them all. So, um, talking a little bit about our clinical engineering shared services that I talked about earlier. This is our this is our team that we're trying to get into a one intermountain perspective. So, we start off with our system director behind me, who's usually rolling his eyes when I'm speaking. Um, and then we have our, our CE Medical Equipment Security, which is the two of us that are up here. We also have one other on our team that couldn't be here. We have our Central Support Manager. These are all based out of a office building um, within the Wasatch Front in the Salt Lake City area. Uh, we have our Service Contract Specialist, our Service Coordination Care Center. They take our calls um, for our engineers out in our facilities. Uh, we also have our Office Coordinator uh, that takes care of the office there, as well as she takes care of a lot of things. I, I, don't, I better not go down there. Uh, we have our inventory and parts coordinator because we actually have a, a site there where we keep inventory and we have it, engineers there as well. So we have a central location to keep uh, additional inventory on it. Um, and we do have our data analysts. Our data analysts used to be on our team. They're now on the IS team, but they're still responsible to clinical engineering. And they actually do a ton of work for us. They make, they make it possible for us to understand if we're making progress. Uh, they're the ones that actually can pull the data out of the tools and give us those pretty reports that I need to be able to explain, to, hey, this is what we're doing. This is the progress we're getting. So very talented team. Um, as I was saying earlier, our hospital operations, we have four CE directors. Uh, we have... Recently, thanks to Mike, we have recently kind of changed our structure a little bit. We now have set up, so we have a succession plan so that you can go from basically a biomed to a team lead, to a supervisor, to a manager, to a director. Gives the, the team an understanding that 
hey, there is some upward mobility, and these are the this is the path I can do to get there. So uh, important um, wasn't there before, Mike. So I'll give him all the credit there. So excited for that. Um, local parks and supply stock. We used to have a lot of that uh, out in our facilities, and some we do in our rural areas. But we do have that central one that I talked about. Make it even better. Um, the central depot, home care and field services areas is an area that Dustin over here used to kind of oversee when he was with Intermountain Healthcare. Um, a uh, bunch of technicians, our hospital and med service. Uh, I know we talked about this in one of the other meetings that I was in. I don't see the gentleman that presented here, but uh, we talked about those that uh, do hospital beds, right? We have an engineer that's responsible for those. He does other stuff as well, but he we hired him in that capacity to actually help us understand that his role is the lead for the beds and making sure to take care of those. So. Um, we also have our dialysis team that uh, reports up to through Mike Westicker as well. Um, awesome folks out there, and that is growing rapidly. We are building two more dialysis centers. Uh, definitely a, a wonderful opportunity there, as well as our sterilizer field service and our DME and, and power chair services. And you may see a couple of those guys uh, recently in, in a couple of our tech magazines. They are amazing, and they do some amazing work. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Summer. You got this. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you. <laughs> uh, hi everyone, my name is Summer Al Ibrahim, and my background is in biomedical engineering. Uh, I'm working with Intermountain here for three years as a medical device cybersecurity specialist. Um, and I would like to introduce uh, some of our mission, vision, and values and high-level objective. Um, just before we started with Intermountain Healthcare Mission, Vision, and Values, I would like to just uh, give uh, a little bit of definition of what is, what are these meanings. So missions will be, will def is a statement that define your purpose and your goals and, as an organization and a team. Your vision is what you're hoping to achieve in the future. So let's say in you know, five years from now, um, and values and high-level objective will be based on your mission um, or what you what is your goal in five years. So you cannot have a strategy and annual goals and KPI if you do not have a clear mission, vision, and values. Uh, so you need to have that. And mission, vision, and values is not supposed to be anything different than your organization mission, vision, and values. Like you can, your HDM department must be aligned with the with organizational uh, mission and values and vision. Um, also, mission, vision, and values are very important uh, for to drive your team towards and to, towards a goal and towards achieving a goal and towards fulfilling a goal. So it's very important to to uh, empower your team as well. Uh, so this is the beginning of any, like if you're empowering and starting a strategies and annual goal and KPI, this is the first step to do that. Um, so, so us and Intermountain, we, our mission, vision and values is not nothing separated than Intermountain Healthcare mission, vision and values. And for Intermountain Healthcare, our mission is to help people living the healthiest life possible and what, what we mean by that is that we we're trying to achieve a healthy community but in case in case our our people need some um health health care um, um need need a health care or need uh to go to the doctor or so then we're going to provide them the extraordinary uh care possible um so our mission our vision is to be model health by providing an extraordinary care and superior service at affordable cost. And what we mean by a fundamental and extra care is to have uh, is to provide safety to our patients, uh, provide quality uh, quality visit, quality work to our patients. Uh, we're trying to have them um, have them the best experience, and we're trying to have a uh, minimizing cost and uh, be financially sound. And we're trying to have opportunities for our caregivers as well to our patients. And HDM department should fulfill these requirements. So as HDM department, we need to ask ourselves, 
how can we make our patients safe through the uh, healthcare or through the medical device environment? We need to ensure that our patients are receiving the best experience possible through our medical device environment. Uh, we need to have our medical device, uh, medical device environment access to them. So we need to ask ourselves how we're going to do that and how we're going to be financially sound to the organization as well as to the patient. Uh, so here is um, here is an example of like what 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 would be the fundamental extraordinary from an HTM standpoint. So for safety, it will be to ensure patients and caregivers are safe by providing an outstanding medical equipment management program, um, and also to have a quality um, quality uh, proposed to them by delivering evidence-based medical equipment service and management that leads to a top performance. Uh, same thing with equity. So eliminate department uh, disparities and create opportunities for caregiver, patients, members, and community. And ensure that CE service event and equipment management experience is pers personalized and caring. And provide care information where we, uh, when and how our stakeholders are uh, prepared with a seamless coordination across the system. Um, and then as well as be indispensable department achieving a high, uh, highest quality service that's the lowest uh, cost possible. Uh, so, and the Intermountain Mission Vision, although it's our goal to achieve, we also need to achieve the, uh, the standards and regulations as well as the main vision. So our standards and regulations requirement needs to be the most fundamental requirement for any HDM department. Uh, so you have to make sure that your department is having a medical device management system that's running. You do have to ha make sure that your PM and CMs are in compliance with the regulations. Um, you need to have an accurate inventory because an accurate inventory will uh, increase the efficiency and the workflow of your organization, will make your CE guys happier. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you need to have a user training. Uh, you need to have a program for recalls and alert. Um, recalls and alert, especially, we do have uh, in Intermont Healthcare, we do have uh, divided it into two uh, pieces. There is one for safety uh, and one for cybersecurity, and we deal with that um, because, like, by having a recalls and alert, will reduce uh, patient, uh, will reduce patient risk, and therefore we are aligned with the main vision. Um, also, we got to have uh, policies and procedures in place. Uh, that's one of the requirements from uh, CMS and FDA and uh, Joint Commission. You have to prove that you are, um, you are writing down your policies and procedures and you, you have to prove that you're doing what you've written. So you have to have this in a place and your team must know about them and they have to be pretty much aware of them. Um, and then we also have a service contract management and uh, record keeping uh, incident response in case that we have a medical device uh, related issue to one of our patients, then the FDA need to be known that within 10 days that we got a, uh, we got a problem uh, related to a medical device as well as to the manufacturer. So combining the joint commission FDA standards, CMS health safety standards, uh, with Intermountain Healthcare Mission, we came up with what we, uh, our goal and strategies. So our mission as a healthcare technology department is to optimize medical equipment maintenance and management strategies to assure clinical quality, patient safety, and best cost value proposition. So, and here, here's what we have done from 2012 to 2016. Uh, we do have our main issue uh, or main vulnerability at Intermont Healthcare is that we are scattered in all over the West. Uh, we do have 25 hospitals. We do have a medical. Uh, we do have a clinical engineering department in each hospital. They the problem that we run at is that each clinical engineering department they do have their own policies, they have their own procedures, they were not aligned into a centralized location where everything everything uh, following the same track. 
So that this is what uh, Mike have done uh, from 2012 to, to 2016 is to centralize our services into one location. And by centralizing, we are achieving work efficiency. We're achieving uh, policies and procedures that's united. So we were having more united work, more uh, efficiency in, in work. So we have completed part inventory. We have centralized procurement processes. Uh, and we did centralized recalls and equipment. We centralized mobile medical devices services, which led us to save $250,000 uh, a year. We also sent, uh, sent, uh, standardized our CE policy so everyone can follow the same uh, procedures and regulatory items. Uh, we did have um, centralized budget uh, and tracking part recruitment. We did um, centralized master service agreement and service strategies and training. So, and with that, our annual cost saving provided by clinical engineering was $600,000 or more. Uh, and this is also aligned with the idea or the main vision of, of being a financially sound to the organization. So, as, as you can see, we're not only a clinical engineering department that's located in the basement of each hospital. We do, we do use our mountains, our beautiful mountains in Utah as a symbolism of elevation. So we do like to elevate our departments. We do like to elevate our organizations, our personal life as well. So we're lucky to have that. That's our view. <laughs> Um, so we're more than just a CE department. Uh, we are we are a professional groups. We do have a data and an analysis team, and those are very essential in order to um, visualize our um, our progress as well as visualizing our gaps. Uh, <coughs> so if we have an annual goals, if we have our huddle board. Uh, huddle board then th those are the ones who will visualize to us, give us numbers. How are we doing? And uh, and it's very essential, very essential for us to be like to to start to create an uh, annual goals for the next year by achieving what we couldn't achieve the year before. Um, we do have our medical device cybersecurity, which is my team and uh, PJ. Uh, so our medical device cybersecurity is responsible for um, for the medical devices that connects to the network, as well as definitely connect to the patients, and uh, store, process, and transmit uh, PHI. Uh, so, because our medical devices today are not just simple medical <coughs> devices, they're like a now they do have connectivity, they can send information, they can process information, they can connect to the network, they can, if, if there is like any medical device, uh, risk uh, associated with cybersecurity, there will be uh, HEPA, HEPA will, uh, will have a HEPA penalty, so we'll have a financial cost added, as well as it's gonna harm our patients. And that's definitely not aligned with our vision, which is keep, keeping our patients safe and reducing the cost. Uh, we, do have, we do have a group of leadership, um, and our leadership help us to keep aligned with the main vision. Uh, we do have um, the equipment uh, management and services, uh, and those are the people who are doing an outstanding jobs in the hospitals, working and uh, uh, be, being compliant with the uh, regulation and standards for medical device management, as well as a service contract are the people who edit, view, and um, ensure that our co contracts are saved in place and uh, definitely have a lot of outcomes financially by reducing the cost for our uh, department as well as Intermountain Healthcare. And with here, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. Gotta hear this thing out. There we go. <laughs> now you can hear me. So, question real quick. How many of you know that this was Summer's first time standing in front of people? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a great job. So this was her first time. 
So yeah. was talking with her earlier and, and said we were doing a presentation down here. And I said, you know what, this would be a great opportunity. <laughs> so Summer came down and uh, from Salt Lake. And, and again, it was her first time presenting. She did fantastic. Uh, really did a great job. So what's next? Um, you know, I'm going to date a few people here. <laughs> okay. Raise your hand if you know who old Kyle is. Yeah, there's one, there's two, there's three. That's about what I figured the people that would raise their hand is three people that have probably been in the field as long or longer than me. Be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> Marianne started when she was two. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I, Facilities that I was working at in Chicago one time. Old Kyle used to be the Joint Commission. So those of you who know George Mills, Old Kyle was the George Mills before George Mills. Okay. Yeah, great guy. Great guy. This one before between them. There wasn't one between them? Yeah. yeah. Who was between them? Right. Oh yeah. yeah. But how long was it? It wasn't uh, I know Old was there for a while. Um but I, I worked for a healthcare system in the Chicago area that included um, Provena, used to be Provena Healthcare System, is now, I don't even know what the, they call it in, in these days. But I was sitting in an environment care safety committee meeting one time uh, at uh, Mercy Medical Center in Aurora. And as we started to go through some of the things in there. Now, old Kyle had left the Joint Commission at that point, and he had taken the job as the safety, security, um, compliance person with Mercy Medical Center in Aurora. So I went into this first meeting where he was there, and we sat down at the table, and he was going through the management plans for each one, and he got to clinical engineering or HTM, and I said, Here's my report owed. Here's where it shows my PM compliance. And here's what shows this. And Ode stopped me. He said, Stop right there. And I said, Okay. And he said, PM compliance? Are you in compliance with the standards? Yes. And he goes, Good. So what? Next metric that I asked him, that I showed him. And he said, So what? And what he told me at that point was he said, if you're reporting data and metrics just to report them, save me the time. Save you the time. Send it to me and I can read it. The only data and metrics that I want to see from you in this meeting are things where you can make a difference. A difference in the organization, whether it's patient safety, whether it's cost, whatever it is. Only show me those things where you can make a difference. Or that you can improve upon. Again, making a difference. So when you look at finding gaps and opportunities to grow within the HTM department, that's where I would that, that's where I would say focus your efforts. That's where you need to take a look at how can we impact regulatory organizational mission HTM. And then define it out in goals, KPIs, standardization initiatives. And I have always said, and I will always say, I've always asked people, I say, how many of you have an HTM mission that's different from the organization? And if you do, take it off the wall, crumple it up, throw it in the garbage. Your mission in HTM should be no different than the organization's. As leaders, it's your job to help your staff understand how they contribute to that mission. What is their role? What is their part? And if you're not doing that, fail. Goals, KPIs, standardization initiatives should lead to that. So again, um, goals, things that you can set goals around. Uh, where you can make a difference. I'm gonna jump through that. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the past at Intermountain Healthcare. So you looked at it, we had variation of equipment tracking, inventory, service scheduling, no standardized workflows, 
And when I say standardized workflows, what I'm talking about there is that this hospital's doing it this way, this one's doing it this way, this one's doing it this way, nobody's doing it the same. Why? Why don't we learn from each other standardized across the board? We had department managers and clinical staff are managing service events. So that's not what they're made to do. That's not their area of expertise. That's what we need to do and allow them to get back at the bedside and be where they should be in that state of care patients. So the present operation, we've integrated service tracking, data entry, uh, reporting for the entire organization. We've got a, a handle on, do we have complete handle on oversight of our authorized service providers? Not yet, but we're getting there. Um, we're a lot further than we were 10 years ago. Um, we look at oversight uh, for the in-house staff, field service support matching. I, I always tell this story because I said, when we first started uh, with the center support services, we started looking at field service support matching and invoicing. And as we started looking at those things, Vincent needs a cup of coffee, <laughs> right? I noticed him, he's, he's coffee is empty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyways, um, what was happening? We were calling them service providers. They were doing service. We were paying the invoice. We weren't attaching field service reports to asset history records, and we weren't matching those. And we found in the first year over close to, I, I, I shouldn't say over, but close to a million dollars that we avoided in cost by matching field service reports with invoices with service contracts to make sure we were getting discounts, parts discounts, labor discounts, we were being overbilled for some, and not intentionally. Our manufacturers, you know, our service providers were doing it intentionally, but by not having a process in place, we weren't capturing, we were paying more than what we should have been paying. We're actually seeing at least $600,000 a year to date Every year we're seeing that, that we're avoiding at least $600,000 of cost. Areas of focus for our HDM department, again, a lot of regulatory stuff, um, data integrity, service contracts. You know, when, I, when we first started, when I first started in Vermont, we started taking a look at things. We gathered, started gathering service contracts because we had individual contracts at individual facilities, even though we were one in Vermont. Um, an example is, of that is when I started looking at Medtronic, we had 56, 56 individual service contracts with Medtronic across our system. 25 hospitals, 56 service contracts. Same model of equipment here that we had here, different pricing. So we went to Medtronic and said, no more. One contract, standardized pricing. Across the board, one invoice. So, and, and that gets us into the data analytics and improving processes. And this is where I'm talking about being able to put things in place that make a difference. <coughs> and not only putting things in place that make a difference, but make them available to your caregivers throughout your organization so that they can see them. So we have a continuous improvement performance dashboard. So I have one from a central level, and then each one of our shops has the same thing. So we're tracking things like documented time. We're looking at, does this thing have a pointer on it? Yeah, it does. So we're looking at average age of open work orders. We're looking at percent of could not locate devices. But when we're looking at that, we're saying, okay, let's set some entry target stretch goals that are associated with them track them throughout the year and let the technicians see where they're at. I can break these reports down, not just from a system level, but I can look at it from a facility level and I can look at it at the technician level. So I can break this report down and I look at my could not locates and I'm at 1.72%. I can go to my facilities chart. I can drill into that and I can see, okay, where's facility A? in comparison to facility B, in comparison to facility C. And if I see one of them's spiked up, I can drill into that and say, okay, now what technician is associated with those? And if I see I've got five technicians and one of them is spiking 
and the other four are flat, now we're going to dig in and find out why. Are they waiting until the last week of the month to do their PMs? And they're going, I got a day left. I'm going to mark them all as good and okay. So we can drill into that, we can dig into that. And when you start putting this data up on the boards, it makes a difference. People look at it, like two of our top performers back here in the back, Ron and, yes. Yeah, where are you mining this out? Right out of our CMMS. <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> PeopleSoft. Um, wow. When I say we're mining it out of PeopleSoft, yeah, Dustin's laughing. Is it coming out of PeopleSoft, Dustin? No. No. Where's it coming out of? It's coming from the business intelligence school. And then it looks like Trevor sees a lot of R now. Is that what this is? Yeah. Well, th these are the performance dashboards in the CI portal. So, and then I'm getting that data and then inputting it in. Now he's linking as much as he can from an automated perspective, so it's flowing in. But yeah, it is it is in PeopleSoft, but we're not getting it is really it, from PeopleSoft. Yeah, that's the only way to put it. It's complicated. <laughs> yeah, it's complicated. That's right. Um, and then the other thing is, is making sure that, that your technicians understand what it is you're looking for, especially here. How many of you, when you put in documented time and you tell your technicians, I want you to document, we are setting our stress. Um, well, that's not right up here. Uh, <laughs> this should be, um, the stretch should be 85% or higher. Um, that's what we're looking for is 85% documented time. So we're looking at chronos time um, and then documented time in the CMMS and we set it at 85%. Uh, right now. And the thing is, is when you look at this and you ask your technicians and you tell them you want to document that time, what's the first thing they're going to say to you? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, really? So you want me to document when I'm in the bathroom? You want me to document? It's big brother. No, no, no. That's not what I'm looking for here. And actually this number right here, this percentage number that I'm looking at means nothing to me. Nothing at all. What means something to me is data and information behind it. If you're documenting 100% of your time, I'm going to drill into the information and I'm going to see where that documentation is occurring. Is it in PMs? Is it in corrective maintenance? Is it in admin time? Where is it at? And then I'm going to drill into it if you're a tech one, tech two, tech three. If you're a tech one and you're spending 40% of your documented time in Admin tests, that's a problem. I'm just curious, with the breakout travel time, they guys are spread out at some shared research. Yes. So they, they document travel time. They document travel time, but we roll it in together in the documented time. So we can't drill into it and see okay. what the travel time was. Do you find that when you set quotas for your team, that they fluff numbers in order to meet whatever the arbitrary targets are? Not these guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, but Dustin did all the time. No, I'm just <laughs> um, Yes. In fact, we just put a new CE director in place, and when she went out and was talking with her staff, and she asked them about documented time, and she asked them about could not locates, they told her, we're whipping the numbers because we've been told if you don't hit that number, your performance evaluation is going to reflect it. And what she did is exactly what I want her to do is to say, that is wrong. We did the same thing with the gas and that 100% document. I mean, that's all we talked about. So we did exactly what you're doing. And, uh, so, yes. Well, and, and that's where the, the communication comes in and, and allow or making sure that, that your caregivers understand why you're doing this. What is the why behind it? And it's not, the why isn't because if you don't hit that number, I'm not going to give you a good performance review. That's not the why. The why is, again, patient care. That's what it's all about. 
We're here to protect utilization. This is what you see. Um, we need to hire more people. Yeah, we hope staff, staff, the rest of the time. Well, and, it, and it's tying, again, it's tying this information into the organization's mission. How does percent of could not locate devices tie into helping people live the healthiest lives possible? Because we want to make sure our equipment is available when they need treatment and care. And if it's not, it's a problem. The other thing that we do at Intermountain, I don't know how much time I should have a where three fifteen. Yeah. Three fifteen. You got fifteen. You got fifteen minutes. Okay. The other thing that we do at Intermountain Healthcare, and this was a uh, vice president uh, that I report up through, that this is one of her things that she loves to see, and that's quick wins. Quick wins. So what we do is we put standardization initiatives in. Our department is required to do three standardization initiatives every quarter, and they are quick wins. Those are things that you put in place, and at the end of 90 days, you completed them. And they're making a difference in the organization. So if you look here, our first one here, um, our organization is really focusing on likelihood to recommend. We're not doing well in the organization with that, um, that, with that score. So they've asked every department in the organization to put a standardization initiative in place that impacts likelihood to recommend. So we looked at it from the HDM perspective and we said, we're not a patient facing department. How do we impact likelihood to recommend? And I said, we can do that. So what we decided to put into place is we have, um, we have a process called Aiden. I knew. <laughs> now what did you introduce? Yeah. We knowledge introduce. Duration. Duration. Uh, explanation. explanation and time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've made <laughs> yeah, them and ask them anything they can do. Okay, that's aided. So it's an acronym. <laughs> that's aided. So what we said was we're going to retrain our entire staff on what aided is and what our expectations are related to them. So when they're walking through the hallway and they see a visitor, or the other thing that we're doing is um, we're, we're putting together a script. At times, our patients walk into, or patients, our caregivers walk into a patient room that's occupied, right? What do they tell the person laying in the bed or the family that's sitting next to it? Never mind me, I'm just going to fix this ventilator that's broke, that's hooked to your <laughs> loved one. No, no, no. We don't want to tell them that. I always tell the story that I had back surgery and I was laying in the hospital and, and um, they had the vital signs monitor up to me and the nurse took my blood pressure and, and she turned around to document and while she was doing that, the cover inflated. And she turned around and looked at it and was like, you know, and then she's like, I don't know why I did that. You know, and she turned back around, she started doing it, it inflated again. And she looked at me and she goes, these things were brand new and they didn't give us very good training on them. <laughs> she didn't know who I was. She had no idea who I was. And I thought, oh, great. <laughs> and I said, you know what? We don't want to be telling our, we don't want our caregivers to be doing things like that when they walk into a patient room that's occupied. So we're developing a script that we expect our caregivers when they walk into the room to do, as well as we have what we call a 10-5 group. At 10 feet, you acknowledge them. At five feet, you wave and say hi so that they understand that, right. hey, we're not, we're not here. We're not staring at our phones. We are here to help. 10 feet, you acknowledge that they're there. And at five feet, you smile and wave and say hello. Of course, with a mask now, they can't tell that you're smiling. So you can be growling at them but uh, with the mask on. But, but anyways, that's what we're doing from a standardization initiative so that is an initiative that we're putting in place and we are going to complete within 90 days and we're going to document all of that in our caregivers individual development plans and so that we know that they've got that training and this is what the expectation is some of the other things that we've got on here is really looking at an acquisition value range we've got devices within our inventory that have no purchase price on them or acquisition value so we're going to take a look at uh, sub-asset type, and we'll say we've got 
10 of these devices, two of them don't have an acquisition value. We'll take the eight, find a median, and that's what we'll put in the acquisition value so that we can do uh, cost service ratio in, in looking at those things. Um, and then we are uh, gonna implement the HTM friendship program, the, the Amy program um, across our system as well. Mike Powers is leading that initiative for us. Um, he tells me that he's almost all the way done with that now that it's to December 31st, so. <laughs> All right, uh, caregiver engagement. So it's really connecting the data, and that's what I talked about before, connecting the data. And one of the ways that we connect the data within our organizations is daily huddles. We have, there are six tiers of daily huddles. Tier one is your frontline caregivers with their leaders. Tier two would be the next step up in the supervisory uh, process. Tier three is, uh, tier three is where I'm meeting with my directors um, on a tier three huddle. Tier four, I join my boss's huddle. And then tier five, he joins his boss. And tier six includes the CEO of the organization. Those huddles occur every day, at least from tier four up. They occur every day. Thank you. <laughs> but anyways, um, the huddles occur same time, same place, 10 to 15 minutes. It's not a problem solving meeting. You're not there to solve problems. You're there to escalate issues and talk about other areas like recognition. Um, we talk about downtimes, whether patients have been rescheduled, uh, things that may need to be escalated up the chain. So when it gets to the CEO, he's not blindsided by something that occurs. They say, did you know that Heber Valley Hospital is on divert because the CT scanner's down, and he can say, yep, heard about that, huh. know what's going on already. So we do that. Um, in our departments, we choose a, facilita a huddle facilitator. It, could be, it doesn't have to be the same person every day. Involve your staff, involve your teammates. So let the, solicit the team for ideas. The best ideas in the department on how to change workflows and processes, make things better, come from your frontline staff not from leadership. So get that idea process, categorize your ideas in, in things to do, things that are in progress, things that are complete. Mike, that's great. Where do you like, index and capture the ideas? Because ideas, uh, you can't exactly know them right away. So you, you can see here that this is a, uh, a portion of a huddle board at one of our facilities okay. where they put it. Now we do have an electronic um, capability, it's, it's called ideas. 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 It's called ideas. Yeah, so it's a light bulb that's on the desktop. You click into it and you put your idea in there and it'll track who put it in, where it came from, and then you can step it through that entire process. So it's done electronically as well. Um, review your KPIs, metrics, and goals. Uh, this is a scoreboard. You should be able to walk into a department, look at that huddle board, and understand what the score is. And that's done by green, red, yellow. I can look at those items and know that this goal right here, based upon the color, that they're on track. This goal here is red, they're not on track. And each one of these that are red or yellow should have a return to green. But you don't put the return to green plan together during the huddle. It's done after. Because the huddle, again, is a scoreboard and it's informational, it's not problem solving. You would be surprised at how effective this process is with the huddles. How long did it take you to get it there? I mean, I implemented a scrum methodology and many different factions of my And it's like daily, I had to remind people that ah, this isn't a report out, it's, it's three things. What did you do yesterday? What are you going to do today? What obstacles are in front of you that you need my help with? That's it. Yep. No more than, than, than a couple of minutes per person. Bang, bang, bang. 15, but man, it took a long time to get people into so like every day reminding them, no, that's not what this is for. And, it, it, and it's still a process. We still get off on a tangent. Um, you know, we may go to a huddle board and we may look at a KPI and it's red and the person will say, well, this is why it's red. Well, you know what, I don't know why. I don't want to know why it's red. It's red. It's an area for improvement. You need to put together a return to green. That's it. Next. 
Um, so I would say, and, and the other thing is I say huddles, same time, same place. Um, I'll tell you that my huddles, what do I, I huddle with my staff twice a week, right? Uh, Mondays and Thursdays, I huddle with my staff. Um, some of the departments out there, are, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, they're huddling. I can tell you though that my huddle with my boss every day, 9.30 every day, and we are done by 9.45 every day. And he has five directors that report during that huddle process, five. We cover recognition, we cover um, downtimes, we cover OSHA um, and caregiver injuries, we cover safety events and near misses, media worthy events and miscellaneous. That's what we cover every day at 9.30. This is the huddle board. So this is a huddle board that I use. I know it's kind of an eye chart here, but this is a huddle board I use um, within my department uh, with my huddles. So I'll pull this huddle board up. You can see here that there are, you know, the hospitals listed here with PM compliance numbers. We track this on a weekly basis. We, we expect our departments to be 25% complete week one, 50% week two, 75% week three, 100% week four. We track it by week. So they will see this on a weekly basis and it will identify by green or red where they're at in, uh, in that week. Um, I talked about drilling into it a little bit more. You can see hospital 21, 259 PMs due, 170 completed, they had 89 incomplete, nine could not locate. I can go down here and this is each one of the caregivers and I can see how many PMs they had assigned and how many they completed, how many they listed as could not locate so I can drill into it by technician. And when you post that on a bulletin, on a huddle board, for all of the techs to see, makes a difference. Isn't that embarrassing to the technician side? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, would it be like a negative? No. Nope. So you tell me. Yeah. No, it's not anymore. It may have been in the beginning. It kind of felt like a big brother. But you said that. But nowadays, you, you look at it and like, damn, so bad. <laughs> you know, you, uh, you want to move on stage. Thanks for the move. Creates a little competition, too. Yeah. Uh, and you got counts all for your. Hold on, I got one. I just was a little confused by the caregiver label. Is that all your technicians? Yeah, that's an intermountain term. Our okay. our CEO of the hospital says everybody that works in our organizations are caregivers. Okay. Whether they're support staff or fun <coughs> clinical, they're all caregivers. So of your 900 PMs that are due at that one facility for the month, they can't get rid of um, right chart. Um, anyway. There are all of your caregivers responsible for all PMs. Yes. Okay. They have their they have their own, but that doesn't mean they can't step outside and help somebody else. Okay. And I'm sure Ron Dan that probably occurs a lot. Dan says that Ron helps him all the time. <laughs> now, what if that becomes a trend where you have caregiver A's consistently? falling behind and now the other team members are getting upset. Then that's that is a responsibility then of local leadership and supervisors to look at and see why. Is there a training deficiency? Is there a workload imbalance? What's what's going on? So it's up to them to look at that's why we can drill into it. Um, this here is the, the could not locate you can see the same thing with the could not locate I can drill into it by caregiver at each facility. So I can see you know, this caregiver here, uh, this one here, 639 work orders completed, 37 of them were good at locates. So that's something, you know, we may look into that and understand why. And maybe it's because they do the medical group. So they're out at the clinics all the time and they're doing equipment that moves a lot. I'm probably out of time, all right. This is, this is Dustin Smith right here. I told you. When he used to work for Intermount. <laughs> you notice he's not leading the huddle board. It's one of our service coordinators here. So this is the huddle board at our central office. You can see here, see here we divide it out into the different categories like stewardship, patient experience, access, quality. Uh, this is a huddle board here from uh, Scott James, our director at McKay Hospital. He gets a little bit more in depth and more detail. 
than some of the others do. So you can see his, uh, an example of his huddle board in comparison to the one at the central office. Um, this is Scott actually presenting, uh, he has an electronic version of his huddle board as well. And he's presenting, this is a group from, um, where did they come from, Sweden or something they were, they were in from touring and the hospital administrator they said, we want to see an example of a huddle board and a review process. And they said, we got just the part to take you to. Took them to HDM. Yeah. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> Next question. 